So I gave a, I gave a talk about a week ago. And uh, the first feedback that I received was that I keep pacing on stage back and forth like a mad lion. And uh, it's great that this is here because it'll force to keep me grounded. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I am uh, an engineer. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Fractal Blockchain, which I'm uh, not going to say what it does because I think it's illegal at this conference. And I'm also the co-founder at Life on Mars. We're a software engineering team based here in Porto that some of you might know. And uh, based on the uh, previous talks, Mine's going to be a little less technical. Uh, hope you still can derive some value from it. So we're going to be talking about a little bit about decentralization just as an introduction. So the context of all of this is Ethereum. We're going to be talking about decentralization. We're going to talk about Ethereum's blockchain paradigm, a little bit about its internals and how it works. Uh, we're going to look at proof of work from a slightly different angle. Um, and uh, we're going to wrap up with some uh, crypto economics. How much time do I have? It's 30 minutes, right? OK. Cool. So, cool. I've got a timer here. It's all good. Thank you. So when um, when people talk about decentralization, they're often coming from a uh, libertarian or a cypherpunk point of view. So they talk about censorship resistance. They talk about uh, resisting government control, and uh, uh, and that's fine. Like it's simply beautiful that I can use the Bitcoin network to transfer value to anyone, or that I can use the Ethereum network to publish anything. And there's no, nothing nobody can do to stop me. That's, that's really cool. And this perspective is very dear to my heart. And it's not wrong, but it's kind of incomplete because it misses a larger point. So first of all, uh, it's important to realize that centralized services are inherently more insecure because they grow into hacker honeypots. And um, I, I guess a fitting analogy for blockchain security is that it's easier to rob a bank than every single customer of that bank. And if we look at centralized services, we, we get things like the Equifax hack a couple of months ago, where more than 100 million people were exposed to identity theft and credit card fraud. Uh, so that, that's one thing that's important to consider. But the second one, and, and this is, I think, a lot more important, is that the incentives of a centralized network uh, work a lot more in benefit of the owners of the network compared to other stakeholders and other participants. So uh, when networks start out, they do everything that they can to attract more users and third-party ecosystem participants like application developers to their network. And they do this because the more users a network has, the more valuable it becomes. And, and the same can be said for their ecosystem. The more vibrant an ecosystem is, the easier it is for it to attract users. So as networks grow in, in users, uh, so there's their power against like the users that fostered this growth in the first place. And, and very predictably, this uh, power asymmetry quickly turns extraction into, or attraction into extraction and um, cooperation into competition, as we'll see in this very neat chart by Andreessen Horowitz that captures these dynamics. So if, if you think of Twitter, for example, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the example. When they started out, they provided a great service for free. Um, and they encouraged third-party developers to build applications on top of their network. And this caused an explosion in third-party apps. It, it helped popularize the service. It helped drive adoption. But as they grew in users and powers, um, well, things started to change. Uh, first of all, they started extracting value from the users. They started charging for the service in, in the form of advertising. And they started phasing out uh, third-party applications because they started regarding them as competition for, for eyeballs. And, and that's fine. That's their business. But that's also the point. It's their business. It's not our business. And nobody had any say in this except for Twitter itself. And this is a predictable path for centralized networks. Like we see that with Facebook. We see that with Google. We have a lot of examples like those. And developers like me are kind of getting a little weary of this. Like where we know what's going to happen. We know what the path is going to be. We don't want to build on top of these services anymore. Um, users as well, they, they also get the short end of the stick. So they're often subject to um, arbitrary decisions by a central authority in which which behaviors are allowed on a network or which content is allowed, which features get developed, what users are let in and what users are banned. Often users have no way to vote except with their feet, but also often there's very little else for them to go. Um, so blockchain technology, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, kind of holds the keys to push back against this centralization. So it will help us take back the internet from the incumbent juggernauts and give everybody else a much fairer chance at uh, participation. And it does this because it introduces this into networks. It introduces trust as a feature. 
trust between the developers, the users, and other network stakeholders. Now, this trust comes first and foremost from the way that the blockchain's integrity is cryptographically secured, but also, and much more interestingly, from the fact that you can use mechanism design and game theory to build token economies on top of this base trust layer, which make it possible for us to trust the network without having to trust any of its individual participants. So this is kind of the context in which, um, or that make, make something like Bitcoin or Ethereum so powerful, is that it gives us the tools to do all of this. Now, Bitcoin came out about a decade ago. Um, some Satoshi people um, decided to release it as a proof of concept for a decentralized currency. Super interesting, very elegant paper, great. But then a few years later, this gentleman, Vitalik Buterin, um, who has be had been trying to convince the Bitcoin community that, uh, well, Bitcoin needed to be upgraded to support more use cases, he failed at that, so he instead decided to deploy his own network. He called it Ethereum. So you can't do much with Bitcoin comparatively. It's essentially a tool for the transferring of value. But Ethereum was to be different. It was to be a world computer where you could perform arbitrary computation and storage. Um, and uh, on top of this, you could build decentralized applications or, or dApps or dApps, uh, the building blocks of which are now called smart contracts. And smart contracts are Turing complete pieces, well, as far as the Ethereum network goes, there are Turing complete pieces of code that sit on the Ethereum blockchain that anybody can deploy and anybody can interact with. Now, this is, uh, this is from the Ethereum white paper, more yellow paper. It's their blockchain paradigm, so everybody has their own. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, so we're just gonna break this down real quick to kind of uh, convey the meaning a little bit better. So cryptographically secure means, uh, or hints at the use of uh, maths and cryptography to secure the integrity of the network. Transactional because it is based on transactions, but more, the more important thing here is the singleton machine part. So it's a singleton because even though everybody keeps a copy of this blockchain on their own system, there is a canonical instance of the Ethereum blockchain that everybody believes in, and that is the result of the consensus between all the nodes in the blockchain. Now, this is a, it's a simple diagram in terms of a state machine of how Ethereum works. So you start from a genesis state, you apply some transactions that bring us to the first state, and so on and so forth, such that if you take all of these transactions in the same order from a genesis state, you can eventually replay them all back to get to the current state that everybody believes in today. Whenever you're syncing a node, this is essentially what is happening if you're doing it without any kind of optimizations. Now, these transitions, uh, these transitions are, that are caused by the transactions are only caused if the transactions are valid. So during this process, there is a validation um, step in which transactions need to work out with the prior states in order to be able to be played. Uh, and these transactions are grouped uh, into blocks, each block being linked cryptographically to the previous blocks. And, and there's, a, there's a utility to this. There's a reason we don't just like link transactions together and you do, we do that in blocks. And uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. So um, this um, kind of causes us to ask these questions here. So who, who creates a block, when they create blocks, and why they create blocks? Um, and uh, we've got answers for all of those. I mean, why is relatively simple. People create blocks because they're rewarded to do that. That is the crypto, the very simple crypto economic mechanic of Bitcoin or Ethereum is that we pay you to try and find out a valid block and issue it to the network. So when a block is created and accepted, then what happens is the miner gets rewarded. The person who creates the block um, gets rewarded. Um, the more interesting question here is the when, uh, because miners don't just, I mean, of course they can start gathering transactions and creating a block and trying to uh, mine it and publish it to the network at any given time. But as we'll see in a little bit, we can look at proof of work as kind of a decentralized clock that guarantees that this only happens roughly every 15 seconds in Ethereum. And the reason that it does this is to prevent an endless number of forks that would be pretty much impossible to deal with. And that is also why we don't deal with individual transactions. It's hard enough to maintain consensus and a, a, a common state of the blockchain with blocks every 15 seconds if we had to deal with a much more torrential uh, influx of blocks, especially taking into account network, network latency, that would be an issue. So this is the number that Ethereum chose and that it works for its protocol. Now, um, 
Ethereum uses proof of work for the time being as its consensus mechanism. And um, you can say that this is a proof that some computation time has been spent. So if I submit a valid block, then you know that I must have expended some effort in order to do this. Kind of not 100% true, but we'll iterate on this a little bit. So this is a very simple description. Ooh, we can't see anything here. It's a very simple description of how proof of work uh, works. Uh, so given a certain challenge, for example, the contents of a block, the amount of transactions, whatever. So the contents of a block say C, you need to find the number such that combined, um, combined with the challenge and hashing it, the result of that starts with n zeros. So this is what's normally um, talked about as the difficulty of the network, because hashes are relatively random, like SHA is a memoryless function, such that if you try a second time or a third or a millionth, you're not any closer to finding the result as the first. So what that essentially means is that the more zeros it has to start, likely the more often you're gonna have to try to find something that happens to start with those zeros. And this is this N is what people mean when they talk about the difficulty of the network. And this is adjusted dynamically by the network as, as it observes the frequency of incoming valid blocks. So uh, the only solution to uh, a problem like the hashing one is to brute force it so we know that time has to be spent here. So here's a really simple example how the, how this works. Uh, you try to, these are wrong, by the way, this is totally random. Uh, if you take uh, ETH as the challenge and you start appending an incremental number to it until you find something that starts with zero, 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 you're gonna have to try a bunch of times. So we wanna, we want to start with eight zeros because that's the difficulty up there. Uh, so we're gonna have to try a bunch of times. What's important to understand here is if I was doing this at random, I could have very well have started with the number 583 because that's what the random function would have provided me. So I could have found this on my first attempt. So, I mean, proof of work might not actually be the best name for this. Perhaps proof of time makes more sense. We were saying before that we know that if we see a valid block, someone must have spent time producing it. But that is kind of wrong because it could have been my first attempt. So what we know is we know that this is, a, this is true, but what I wanna convey is that this isn't necessarily true of the miner. This is true of, of the network, because we know that the network has to have expended a certain amount of computation to find that, uh, that block. And let's, let's look at what this means from another angle. Like, um, take the hash rate that is often published on websites. So we know what the hash rate of the Bitcoin blockchain is or the Ethereum blockchain is. Where, this, where do they get those numbers? There's no, there's no like minor registration where people publish the power of their hardware and how often they use it. No, no, none of this is known. All we know is that the network has a certain difficulty and that somehow blocks keep being found roughly every 15 seconds. So there must be a certain amount of computation being expended by the network as a whole, be that one person or 10 million, we, we have no idea, be it here, be it on the moon, we don't know. But we know the network is doing that. And what the network is doing here is acting as a decentralized clock through proof of work. So having a difficulty in finding these blocks, not knowing who is participating, kind of turns this into a very abstract tick, tick, tick system that guarantees that blocks come in a way that they're spaced enough to make consensus doable and not a total mess. Because we don't need this clock to be precise. We don't need to know exactly when things happened. And a lot of this is based on self-reported timestamps. All we need is an order because we can't spend money that we haven't received. We can't spend money that we already spent and we can't read the value of, a, of an argument or of a variable if it hasn't been written yet. So order is really important on the blockchain. So it doesn't matter when exactly things happen, it matters in what order they happened and proof of work helps us maintain that clock. So let's look a little bit into uh, internals in Ethereum. Um, it works a little bit differently to Bitcoin. In some ways it's a simpler model, uh, in others it's a bit more complex. So there's two types of accounts. Externally owned accounts are what folks normally use. So you have a public and a private key and then you can do stuff with that. Contract accounts are where the so-called smart contracts are stored. They're, they're both first class citizens on the Ethereum blockchain, but they're different in what they can and cannot do. Um, 
So, for example, an externally owned account, something that I have, I can send a message to a contract, I can transfer value to another account, I can interact with the blockchain in, a way, in any way I please. But a contract account, and this is something that folks don't often realize when they're coming to Ethereum, a contract can't start action on its own. It can't monitor the blockchain for some event and then respond. It certainly cannot do external API calls and get out of the blockchain to find information. Everything a contract does and everything a contract knows has to kind of be poked, so it does something. And they're not, they're not independent agents that are waiting for things to react to. Um, another important concept in Ethereum is the concept of Ether. So because Ethereum is supposed to be a, a public platform for arbitrary computation and storage, running a node is, well, we'd expect it to be a heavy task because the node would have to store said storage and compute said computation. So we need to make sure that people don't abuse the network. Um, one of the ways to do that, or the way that Ethereum found out to do that, uh, was the introducing the concept of gas. So you need to pay a transaction fee or gas uh, in everything that you do in the Ethereum blockchain, and the amount of gas is proportional to the volume of your computation and storage. So operations in the Ethereum virtual machine, so the, the very basic, you know, write this, uh, push this uh, thing into the stack, or pop that thing from the stack, or whatever, all of these have an associated gas cost, it's just a scalar value. And for each of those gas things that your transaction is gonna do, you say that you'll be willing to pay a certain amount of ether for it. Now, those are some random weird characters because ether is a really large kind of, it has a, a, a it's, it's, it's got a large denomination. So the smallest bit of ether is called way, it's 10 to the power of, power of minus 18. That's essentially 20 gig away. So if you wanna find out how much this transaction or how, how, what's the maximum transaction fee that you'd issue for a transaction like this, is you take the gas limit that you set by saying, I do not want this transaction, whatever it ends up doing, to spend more than 50,000 gas, and I do not want to pay any more than 20 gig away for each of, these, of the gas in this transaction, then you know what your maximum transaction fee goes. Um, this also helps prevent denial of service attacks because you can't just spam the network with everything. So it acts as a network protection as well. Uh, so what happens in a transaction is that you're going to do some operation, you're going to do some other operation, then it turns out you have a ton of remaining gas because you kind of padded this a little bit. Calculation around this isn't very easily done yet. Um, so you pad it a little bit and then you kind of get what's, uh, what you didn't use back to you. However, uh, if you start a transaction that does a bunch of operations and eventually uses up all your gas, that's going to be logged as a failed transaction. You're going to lose your transaction fee, you're going to lose your gas, and this isn't refunded to you. And uh, who does this go to? Well, it also goes to the miner. So uh, transactions, um, uh, they have fees. So when you, when you mine a block, you get all of the fees of the transactions that were in the block, and you also get new ether that was minted by the acceptance of the block into the network. And miners get this, so they kind of get to choose, this is not ideal necessarily, they kind of get to choose what transactions they'll include in the blocks that they'll generate, such that in periods of high network usage, you likely want to pay more for the gas because miners will be more inclined to include your transaction will be processed faster. Not necessarily great. Um, <laughs> I wanna bring this up because I think it's a cool little uh, thought experiment project. It's called the gas token. So Ethereum has a couple of refund mechanisms. One of them is the sim simple, easy one uh, that I just uh, explained before in which you reserve a certain amount of money or for a transaction fee. If you don't spend it all, you get it back. But because every node in Ethereum, roughly, has to store the stuff that you tell it to store, then you have your data kind of spread throughout thousands and thousands of nodes everywhere. And if you clear that data, Ethereum rewards you. So every time, that you delete data that you had previously stored on the network, or every time that you destroy a contract that you had deployed to the network, Ethereum will give you part of your transaction fee as a reward for having done so. So what these folks did was they created this smart contract that allows you to, in periods of low gas time, when there's not a lot of usage in the network, people don't have to pay a lot of gas for things to go, um, to go through, you store a bunch of data on some contract and get some tokens issued to represent that. These tokens are tradable, so you can talk about gas futures, I guess. Um, and then what happens is when uh, the gas prices are super high, then you can, as part of a transaction that you wanna do, that you wanna pay a lot of gas for, and you wanna make sure that it gets included, you can free up 
the storage that you caused in this contract so that you get a lot of stuff refunded as part of that transaction. So I just thought it's an interesting mechanic that I'd bring up because I, I thought this was really smart. Um, so Ethereum is, has also been incredibly instrumental to the explosion that we've recently seen in the blockchain space. So uh, Bitcoin kind of incepted the whole thing, but because you can't do much with it, it's kind of fixed in the scope of application. But because Ethereum is, uh, is a Turing complete platform, then people have been building all sorts of stuff on top of it. And, and, and I mean, there's, these aren't necessarily the best examples. This is an old slide, but I really like things like self-sovereign identity systems or voting systems, insurance contracts. Those are all great examples of what people have been playing around on the blockchain to do. Uh, nine more minutes, okay. So um, we, we had a great talk just now about the origin of money. I'm going to contribute to that a little bit with, a, with an example. Um, so about a century ago, France invaded Madagascar. Um, and uh, this was in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, I don't really know. But it was somewhere around the turn of the century. And uh, they invaded the island, they conquered the island, and then they kind of had to get an economy going. So they could go the old style and just like enslave everybody. But at the time, that was already terrible. Uh, and also at the time, we kind of knew that a slave economy doesn't really go anywhere. So what they decided to do instead is something that has been done over and over throughout history, and it is one of the ways that money happens into existence, which is the governor of Madagascar decided to print out a bunch of bills, bunch of notes, coins, whichever the unit of account was, uh, and decided to call it Magalazi francs. And this is a new currency. It now exists. I printed a bunch of it. Now, simultaneously, it also demanded that every citizen of Madagascar had to pay an yearly tax in, to the government in this currency. Now remember, nobody has this currency except for the government. And the only way for you to get this currency in your hands would be to go and work for a friend of the government, somebody that owns a plantation, somebody that owns a railroad, somebody that owns a port. So essentially what they did was they kickstarted the whole economic system by getting people to do what they wanted them to do, by putting the right incentives in place through inventing a token that was completely worthless and through telling them that they have to get that token back. And this is a little bit, like this is a shitty example, admittedly, but I think it illustrates what folks are doing around blockchain. And, and this part I love because you can deploy an economic system without taking over a country. You don't need to hurt anybody. You can play with the incentive machine that is the blockchain to try and see what kind of economic incentives you can put in place to mold the behavior of the people that choose to participate um, in your network. Because the, the genius of Bitcoin wasn't the blockchain that existed before. It wasn't proof of work that existed before. The genius of, of Bitcoin was how we'd put all of this together to get to, to the conclusion of, huh, so if, every, if there's a ton of copies of this database, and if everybody runs it, this would actually work. But how do we get everybody to run it? Well, you invent magic internet money, or you invent Magalazi francs, or you invent anything like that. But then suddenly you've got a whole economy going on. And I think that that is fascinating. And I, I, I can't explain necessarily how that works. I'm just observing how things are. And I think this is incredibly powerful. And I'm curious to see where this will take us. Um, and th this is a definition of crypto economics by Vitalik Buterin. I think it's a really powerful one. So you use economic incentives to reward people that help further the goals of a system and to penalize those that work against the goals of the system. Now note that nobody is obliged to, to participate in the system. This is a voluntary thing. So you're not really hurting anybody that didn't want to be hurt. But if you put something like this in place with the right shelling points and the right Nash equilibriums, then you get to a place where you have the behavior that everybody wants everybody else to have out of everybody else's self-interest. And this is magical for me because you can build, <coughs> you can build all sorts of things based on systems like these. <coughs> You can build, and, and you can build them decentralized, which is, I mean, going back to the beginning of the talk, it's the whole point. Like you can build prediction markets and they help you see the future. They help make sure that people put their brains and their knowledge to the best possible work to reveal what's coming ahead while incentivizing people to remain honest. The, the example this morning or early afternoon about lists, token curated registries and curation markets, I think that's incredibly powerful as well. Because before, we did not have a way to guarantee that a list is judiciously curated, except for out, you know, out of people's reputation or self-interest um, 
in other domains. And this we can work with a group of complete strangers that nobody knows who they are and still quality emerges. Uh, you've got, and, and these are you know, kind of high end examples. You've got dating apps. You've got dating apps that are using token economics to fight spam and to increase the quality of matches. And I think that this is, I don't know, I just think it's fascinating. Social networks don't have to worry about the cold start problem anymore so much because better than free is paying people. And if you look at something like Steam, which is a very interesting experiment, then what you have is you have folks that are incentivized to participate in the early days of the network and create content, thereby necessarily increasing the quality of the thing they're participating in because the system is working on their behalf and not extracting value from them in an intransparent way. So um, to finalize, these are the next steps for um, Ethereum, in case anybody's curious. One of them is Ethereum is planning to move to proof of stake. Proof of stake is a completely different consensus method. It's not a decentralized clock anymore. It's a lot more like a lottery, which is the word people use to describe proof of work incidentally. Um, it's an interesting mechanic whereby your chances of creating a valid block are proportional to the amount of money that you're willing to lose or that you stake uh, against the validity of that block. Which kind of has a Nash equilibrium there because, or people say that it does, uh, hasn't been proven because you don't want to screw with a network that has a lot of your money because then your money becomes pointless. Um, they're looking into sharding as well, which is just a fancy way of saying partitioning. So you kind of separate the blockchain into chunks and you have nodes process only one or some of those chunks, thereby increasing the throughput because you're not limited by node slowness as much. Um, you've got layer two solutions as it's been talked about today. I mean, the Lightning Network is a thing for Bitcoin. Here we've got something like Raiden, for example, that works with state channel frameworks as well. Uh, we've got a fantastic solution called Truebit, uh, which I don't fully understand, but it's about provable computation. So if I give you a large data set and an algorithm to run, how do I know that the result that you send me is a valid result? Well, turns out you can break computation down in steps and issue cryptographic challenges against some of those steps. And you can say, step eight of the computation, I should expect this result, what result did you produce? This kind of stuff. And you can do this until you've got a, uh, enough confidence that things were done properly. And then the last point is an incredibly important one, perhaps the most important one, which is smart contract security. Now, I'm an engineer. I'm a developer and I know that my generation has been trained on the whole move fast and break things bullshit. That's great for the web because we don't have to issue updates on CDs anymore. So I, I get the, you know, I get the zeitgeist, but you can't really bring that philosophy when you're moving assets from place A to place B. You can't really be a cowboy if you're working on a purportedly eternal ledger. Uh, you have to be very, very careful about how you move forward, and people are not. So you've got millions in funds that are locked up or hacked or whichever uh, because people are not careful about the contracts that they write. So part of that is because of the choice to let people access a Turing complete language to move around everybody else's money. Uh, part of it is the choice to partly base that on JavaScript. And part of that is that the ecosystem hasn't had the time to evolve yet to bring about like formal verification tools, for example. All of that is being worked on. There's projects like Mithril and Oyente, but we're just not there yet at the moment and it's gonna take a little bit before we are. So, oh, 29 minutes, beautiful. So um, that's my email. If anybody has any questions, uh, that's my company's website. And uh, if anybody has any now, I'm very happy to uh, reply. Oh, the security researcher. No, no, it's not a security talk. Thanks a lot for your talk, I really liked it. But um, I also really liked the example of Twitter at the, at the start. Um, it made me think, would it still be the same motivation for you um, if you consider that actually Butterland might change the fees tomorrow? Uh, who, sorry? Butterland, so Ethereum might decide Oh, to I don't care about Ethereum. I don't care about any no, network. No, no, I'm saying if we build on centralized systems, then we, we don't know what happens. That's, that's the motivation you said. But in decentralized blockchains, it could also be that the fees or, or uh, uh, the way that rewards are made can change. Of course. And, and so my question is, how do you compare those two? It, uh, is it, it the depends same? on the governance model. 
So uh, in the case of Twitter or any other centralized platform, you can just expect never to have any say in anything. And you, you can't, and I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm this is really not a value judgment. It's just how things are. It's somebody else's business, literally. So it's their decision. They make the call and I kind of just, you know, I take what I get. And you can think about this differently. You also have your business, I'm sure. But on a decentralized network, you can have things like decentralized governance models, like what Ethereum doesn't, for example, but what other blockchains are playing with, which is the idea that any kind of protocol change would have to be approved by, say, a majority of uh, token holders or something along those lines. And I I'm, I'm don't think that we've yet found a good governance model. One of the reasons is that people obviously don't vote. And one of the reasons for that is that almost everybody is in the space to speculate about the value of stupid tokens. So we're not at a level of maturity, I think, where that is going to work. But in my opinion, that's the direction of this. And as long as the network keeps serving the users of the network, and it makes sure that it does that by giving the users the proper voice and choosing the direction of the network, I think that those that balance will always be established or it will at least e be easier to establish relatively to a centralized system. But I don't know, I need a crystal ball for that. I, yeah. uh, yes, uh, first of all, I'm an economist. Um, I'm interested with your remark when you're talking about uh, crypto economics, which means that um, somebody or an institution should be assigned to do punishment and reward. To, to give the punishment and uh, to give the rewards. But in the parallel system like today's, when we have um, a common monetary policies, fiscal policies already put in place, how can we put that? Like, do you introduce a parallel, another parallel system in the economy where we already have financial system, fiscal system, or right. you delete all of them and you scrap it and you, you build new one? Uh, that's that, that's kind of a multi-layered answer there. I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, the first thing that I would say is I'm not talking about currency at all. I, I think currency currency was what uh, was the proof of coin pr proof of concept that Bitcoin chose to deploy. Currencies are really complicated. We've got a lot of highly paid, really smart people trying to manage that based on the economic conjecture, and I know nothing about that, and I really doubt that something like Bitcoin is going to replace that. So let's put currency aside for a second because I'm not talking about currency when I talk about crypto economics. I, I'm talking about economics not from a financial perspective necessarily, but from a behavioral perspective. That's more I'm coming from here. So for example, this is an example that I often give, even though it's not a, it's not a great model in my view, but there's this dating app called Luna, and it's a, it's a blockchain-based dating app. And uh, their model is broken because of reasons that don't really matter here. But the point is that they make it so that I am willing to pay more to send you a message if I believe the match will be of higher quality and the system rewards me if the match indeed was. So this kind of sets in motion a bunch of behaviors that avoid people spamming everybody else because they'll have to pay dearly for that. This is what I mean with behavior incentivization. It has nothing to do with scrapping the euro. It has nothing to do with government oversight. It has to do with building a set of rules for people around something they collectively choose to hold dear, like a random token like the dollar or Dogecoin, and make it so that if they don't like to lose it, they need to work in a certain way. It has nothing to do with offering a parallel solution to what whatever the European Central Bank is doing. That might be sorted out in the future, it might be Bitcoin, it might be Zcash, it might be something completely different. I personally believe it will be a universe of liquidity in which it doesn't really matter what asset you own as long as you can find an exchange to exchange it for whatever your baker is taking it, be it airline miles, be it reputation score, be it whatever it is. Or did it really need the incentive of cryptocurrency to have a smart contract A couple of things. Uh, one of them is, yes, obviously Ethereum could have started differently. Um, I'm not making any value judgments here. Uh, yes, they could have. 
Uh, another answer to that is yes, there are test nets. So there is Ethereum clones that you can use that do not touch what you would call real ether. Third of all, Ethereum started with play money, it was called ether, and then it stopped being play money at some point. Just like Bitcoin stopped being play money at some point, they all start with play money. And finally, Ethereum did an ICO when they launched. And in order to do that, they needed a token. Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. Well, I think we are done with questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.